The title of this presentation is The Clinical Application of Speckle Tracking Analysis of the Fetal Heart, a New Technology. T.S. Eliot was one of the 20th century's most gifted poets and writers. He was insightful and wrote the following, We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. This statement pertains to the historical journey of the Four Chamber View. In 2015, I acquired the TomTech offline software to measure the size, shape, and function of the fetal heart and develop equations that were used to develop graphs and z-scores to be used to evaluate fetuses at risk for cardiovascular disease. I have no conflict of interest, as I have not received any compensation from TomTech or any other company as a result of my research efforts in this area. As a result of my research in collaboration with Berthold Klaus from TomTech, as well as other physician colleagues, we published 23 peer-reviewed studies that explain the measurements derived from speckle tracking analysis of the fetal heart and their clinical utility. This illustrates preload factors that alter stroke volume. If the preload or amount of blood entering the ventricles is increased, this results in an increased stroke volume and cardiac output. Conversely, factors that decrease preload, such as hypoxia, result in a decreased stroke volume and cardiac output. The frank starling curve illustrates that as the preload increases, cardiac output increases. However, there is a critical point in which further increases in preload results in decreased cardiac output. This illustrates factors that alter ventricular contractility. If contractility is increased, this results in a higher stroke volume, resulting in increased cardiac output. Conversely, factors that decrease contractility, such as hypoxia, result in decreased stroke volume and cardiac function. This illustrates the effect of peripheral resistance on cardiac output. If the peripheral resistance is increased, this results in decreased stroke volume and cardiac output. The frank starling curve illustrates that as the afterload of peripheral resistance increases, cardiac output decreases. Both fetal heart rate patterns demonstrate a baseline heart rate of 140 beats per minute. Why would the category 3 tracing, demonstrating a sinusoidal pattern, be more ominous? When adult and pediatric cardiologists examine the heart, they evaluate more than just the heart rate. Cardiac function is a combination of the forces that affect stroke volume, alter heart rate, and ultimately cardiac output. This illustrates the various components that interact to maintain adequate cardiac output. However, when there are changes in preload or afterload, alterations in heart rate, alterations in chamber size and chamber shape, or contractility, fetal cardiac output may be altered, resulting in cardiac dysfunction. The question we should pose is, what should be evaluated in the fetal heart? In this presentation, I will share with you a new approach to evaluate the fetal heart using speckle tracking analysis. The measurements of the heart that would be important to consider would be first the shape and size of the four chamber view, followed by the shape, size, and contractility of the ventricles. Let's now examine measurements of the shape and size of the four chamber view. The shape of the four chamber view can be computed by identifying the end diastolic frame. Two measurements are made. The first is the basal apical length in red, and the second the transverse width in blue. The term used to describe the shape of the four chamber view is the Global Sphericity Index, or GSI, which is computed by dividing the length by the width measurement. The mean value is 1.2 with a standard deviation of 0.09. The fifth centile is 1.08. Any value less than 1.08 is considered to be a round or globular shaped heart. After evaluating the shape of the four chamber view, the next step is to examine its size. An increased size, known as cardiomegaly, has a long list of associated fetal problems. This includes structural malformations of the heart, arrhythmias, abnormalities of peripheral vessels, and other fetal diseases. This is from a paper entitled, Fetal Heart Size, a Comparison Between Point-to-Point -point Trace and Automated Ellipse Methods Between 20 and 40 Weeks of Gestation. To measure the size of the four-chamber view, we selected the end diastolic area and circumference using either the point-to-point -point trace or the ellipse tool on the ultrasound machine or using offline software which is part of a DICOM viewer. From these equations, a z-score value and its corresponding centile can be computed for individual fetuses at risk for an increased area or circumference of the four-chamber view 
from equations using fractional polynomial regression and compute the mean and standard deviation for independent variables such as gestational age, BPD, head circumference, thalamus circumference, femur length, and the estimated fetal weight. From these equations, the z-score is computed by subtracting the expected mean value derived from the above equations from the measured value from the fetus at risk. This value is then divided by the standard deviation derived from the above equations from the control group. The z-score is equivalent to the standard deviation and has an equivalent centile. For example, the 50th centile has a z-score value of 0. The 5th centile has a z-score value of minus 1.65, and the 95th centile has a z-score value of 1.65. Computation of z-score values was used in many of the publications that I will discuss in this presentation. These are the corresponding graphs for the area of the four-chamber view using the estimated fetal weight as the independent variable. Note that the graphs for the area using the point-to-point -point trace, or the ellipse method, are almost identical. We also provide an Excel calculator for the ease of computation with this paper. In a follow-up paper, we computed the area of the four-chamber view using the same diameters used for the GSI measurement. The equations from the analysis use the same seven independent variables described using the point-to-point -point and ellipse techniques. A calculator was also provided for ease of computation. This is a comparison of graphs from our study and a recently published study from the Barcelona Group. Note how similar the graphs are for the width, length, and area. Once the four-chamber view size and shape have been analyzed, the next step involves measuring the shape, size, and contractility of the right and left ventricles. However, let's ask the following question. What would be the characteristics of the ideal measurement tool to evaluate the right and left ventricles? First, it would be to measure the size, shape, and contractility of the ventricles. Second, it would simultaneously make all of the above measurements. Third, it would be angle independent of the position of the four-chamber view in relation to the ultrasound beam. Fourth, it would provide results of the actual measurements from which z-scores and centiles could be computed using different independent variables of fetal biometry and gestational age. Speckle tracking analysis meets all of the previous criteria. Let's now explore this new diagnostic tool developed for fetal use. Using the right ventricle as an example, the user simply places the cursor at the base of the ventricle, points 1 and 2, and at the apex, point 3. This then activates the TomTech software analysis to compute the endocardial borders at in systole and in diastole. Once the yellow lines identify the contour of the endocardium, the user can adjust each point of the contour as needed. What is speckle tracking analysis? The endocardium of each ventricle is composed of digital speckles. The image on the left illustrates a portion of the endocardium of the ventricular septum, which has speckles of various shades of gray and intensity represented by the green box. These speckles located at different locations along the endocardial border can be tracked by computer software as the ventricles contract. From the X and Y coordinates, the software identifies 49 points along the endocardial border and divides the ventricular chamber into 24 equal segments. For example, segment 1 is at the base, segment 12 in the mid-chamber, and segment 21 in the apical area. In addition to the 24 segment widths, the software computes the length of the chamber. The software also computes the area of the chamber. Let's examine the initial output from the TomTech software. Once the computation is completed, this display appears on the screen. I will explain the components of the contents of this screen in the lecture in which I do a live demonstration of the program. The TomTech analysis provides the user the option to download additional measurements that are not seen on the screen. The screen displays measurements that include strain, length, width, area, and annular plane systolic excursion. The exported XML file also contains one additional measurement of the mid-chamber width which is not displayed on the screen. Let's now examine the specific measurements derived from speckle tracking analysis, many of which have not been reported until we published our studies. This is a new concept, the 24 segment in diastolic and in systolic widths of the right and left ventricles. The graphic on the right illustrates 24 segments with segment 1 at the base, segment 12 located in the midsection of the ventricle, and segment 24 located at the apex. In addition, the length of each chamber can be computed. These end diastolic and end systolic measurements form the basis for a number of derived measurements that will now be discussed. 
In this paper entitled Evaluation of the Right and Left Ventricles, an Integrated Approach Measuring the Area, Length, and Width of the Chambers in Normal Fetuses, we measured the end diastolic length, widths of segments 1 and 12, and the area of each ventricle. While these measurements were obtained using speckle tracking analysis, they have also been reported using other online and offline methods. The table from the XML export lists these measurements for the base, mid-chamber, length, and area. This is a comparison of graphs from our study and a recently published study from the Barcelona group. Note how similar the graphs are for the right and left ventricular length. The ventricular width at the base is similar for the LV. However, there is a difference for the RV 95th centile line. The ventricular width at the mid-chamber is similar for the LV, but there is a difference for the RV 95th centile line. The ventricular area has a wider distribution for the 5th and 95th centiles for both ventricles. The differences in chamber size can be explained by the fact that the Barcelona study measured the ventricles with the apex at 12 o'clock, which results in less accurate identification of the endocardial borders as a result of lateral resolution of the ultrasound beam. This would result in larger measurements of the end diastolic area. Our study measured the chambers when the apex was at 9 o'clock, with better definition of the endocardium as the result of axial resolution. This study was entitled Comprehensive Evaluation of Fetal Cardiac Ventricular Widths and Ratios Using a 24-Segment Speckle Tracking Technique. The 24-Segment RV-LV ratio did not correlate with gestational age or fetal biometry of the head, abdomen, or femur. These ratios are important when there is ventricular disproportion. The next set of measurements involves computing the shape of the ventricles from the 24-segment sphericity index. This is computed by dividing the length of the ventricle by each of the 24-segment widths at end diastole. These measurements allow the examiner to quantify the shape of the ventricle. Lower sphericity index values being associated with a globular-shaped chamber and higher values with a more flattened chamber. The Tompex software reports the values to compute the sphericity index for segments 1 and 12 which represent the base and mid-chamber widths. These diagrams illustrate the three types of measurements of contractility we can evaluate using speckle tracking analysis, global, transverse, and longitudinal. Let's examine each one in detail. Global contractility examines the effect of transverse and longitudinal contractility on the entire ventricle. This is accomplished by measuring the fractional area chains, or FAC. The area for the right and left ventricles are computed for end diastole and end systole. Once the areas are measured, the equation for computing the fractional area change is simply the end diastolic area minus the end systolic area divided by the end diastolic area and multiplied by 100. The higher the value, the better the global contractility. The TomTech software computes the FAC for the right and left ventricles. The next measurement of ventricular function we computed from speckle tracking analysis was the 24-segment transverse contractility or fractional shortening. 24-segment widths were measured at end diastole and end systole. The real-time image illustrates movement of the ventricular and septal walls from a sample of six segments. Notice how the yellow dots move in the clip. Septal and lateral wall movement for the LV have a movement towards the center of the chamber, as manifest by the yellow dots and the graphic on the right. However, there is less movement of the septal wall of the right ventricle towards the center of the chamber compared to the left ventricle. This represents the 24-segment fractional shortening values for the right and left ventricles. Notice that the mean blue line for the right ventricle is constant from the base represented on the left by segments 1 to 8 to the apical segments represented by segments 18 to 24. This is because most of the transverse movement from the lateral wall of the right ventricle as demonstrated in the graphic, and not the septal wall. The left ventricle represented by the red line, however, has a higher mean value compared to the right ventricle from segments 7 to 24. This is because of the contribution of the inward movement of the interventricular septum. The measurements from the TomTech output enable the user to compute the base segment 1 and the mid-chamber segment 12 fractional shortening. Traditionally, this has been done by using M-mode ultrasound in which the cursor is placed at the lateral wall perpendicular to the annulus. The excursion of the annulus is then measured. 
Abnormal values are present when the angular movement is less than expected. Now let's examine the use of speckle tracking to measure the same angular movement as the M mode. This is called basal lateral and septal wall angular plane systolic excursion. The distances from the apex to the base represented by the blue lines at end diastole are measured as well as the distances represented by the red lines at end systole. The differences between the two is called angular plane systolic excursion. This can be measured from, for both the lateral and septal walls of the right and left ventricles. The tom tick output computes the lateral and septal angular plane systolic excursion for the left ventricle and the lateral wall of the right ventricle. These graphs represent the mean 5th and 95th centiles for the left ventricular lateral and septal walls and the lateral and septal walls for the right ventricle. Notice the lateral wall excursion is greater than the septal wall excursion for both ventricles. When we compare the right ventricular lateral wall and the left ventricular lateral wall, the right ventricular angulus moves further towards the apex than the left ventricle. However, there are no differences between the ventricles for the septal wall angular movement. A second measurement of longitudinal contractility is called the longitudinal angular plane fractional shortening, in which the center of each ventricular chamber is identified and their corresponding lengths are measured at end diastole and end systole. This measurement is computed by subtracting the systolic length in red from the diastolic length in blue and dividing the value by the diastolic length multiplied by 100. The tom tick output provides the measurements for this computation. A fourth measurement of longitudinal contractility is called global longitudinal strain. This is measured by computing the length of the endocardium at end diastole, represented by the blue lines, and the length of the endocardium at end systole, represented by the red lines. The cardiologists have computed global strain by subtracting the end diastolic length from the end systolic length and dividing the value by the end diastolic length. This gives a negative value because the diastolic length is longer than the systolic length. The more negative the global strain value, the better the contractility. For example, a minus 27 is better than a minus 13. The TomTac output provides the global strain for the right and left ventricles, as well as the right ventricular free wall strain. This is a list of studies that measure left ventricular strain. We compared their mean values with our data and found the results from the studies highlighted in red were within our normal range. This is a list of studies that measured right ventricular strain. We compared their mean values with our data and found the results from the studies highlighted in red were within our normal range. The measurements of the end diastolic and end systolic volumes and ejection fraction are provided in the TomTac output. In addition, the heart rate is also provided from which the stroke volume, cardiac output, and cardiac output per kilogram can be computed. These are the graphs for left ventricular function measurements using the estimated fetal weight as the independent variable. While measurements using speckle tracking analysis have been reported in normal fetuses, the following studies have been done in fetuses with pathological conditions. These are two studies of fetuses with coarctation of the aorta. The two studies examine fetuses with a postnatal diagnosis of coarctation. The first study evaluated the shape, size, and contractility of the ventricles in 54 fetuses with coarctation of the aorta. The second study examined 54 fetuses with coarctation and 54 fetuses with a prenatal false positive diagnosis of coarctation. Using logistic regression analysis, we were able to detect 96% of fetuses with, with coarctation with a false positive rate of 4%. This is the highest reported detection rate for coarctation in the literature. Let's examine how speckle tracking analysis helps to increase the detection of tetralogy of flow. Using speckle tracking analysis, this study was entitled Evaluation of Fetal Cardiac Size and Shape, a new screening tool to identify fetuses at risk for tetralogy of flow. In this study, we identified size measurements that were able to separate fetuses with tetralogy from normal fetuses. The measurements included the size and shape of the four-chamber view, and the size and shape of the ventricles. This resulted in a 90.9% sensitivity, specificity of 98.5%, and a false positive rate of 1.5%. The study also provided a calculator in which the user can enter values for the length and diameters of the four-chamber view and the right and left ventricles to compute the probability of tetralogy of flow. 
Let's examine the results of a study of 50 fetuses with an estimated fetal weight less than 10th percentile. These are the two studies published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2019. Our study was divided into two groups. Group 1 had an estimated fetal weight of less than the 10th centile, but had a normal Doppler of the umbilical artery and a normal cerebral placental ratio. These fetuses were labeled small for gestational age. Many investigators have thought these fetuses were not at risk for adverse outcome. In the next few slides, I will review the findings for fetuses who were classified small for gestational age. When the size and shape of the four-chamber view was examined, 25 fetuses had an abnormal umbilical artery Doppler and or an abnormal cerebral placental ratio. In 92% of these fetuses, various combinations of an increased width, area, or global sphericity index were present in the four-chamber view, and 97% had abnormal ventricular contractility. When the size and shape of the four-chamber view was examined, 25 fetuses had a normal umbilical artery Doppler and a normal cerebral placental ratio. In 80% of these fetuses, various combinations of an increased width, area, or global sphericity index were present in the four-chamber view. Of these, 85% had abnormal ventricular contractility. These next few slides will illustrate the types of abnormal contractility in the SGA fetuses with normal Doppler studies and those with an abnormal umbilical artery Doppler and or an abnormal cerebral placental ratio. This slide demonstrates the percent of fetuses with an abnormal fractional area change of the right and left ventricles. Note the percent of fetuses were similar irrespective of their diagnosis. This slide demonstrates the percent of fetuses with an abnormal transverse fractional shortening of any of the 24 segments of the right and left ventricles. Note the percent of fetuses with an abnormal RV transverse fractional shortening was higher than the LV in all groups. This slide demonstrates the percent of fetuses with an abnormal longitudinal contractility for any of the three different types of measurements for the right and left ventricles. Note the percent of fetuses with abnormal findings were similar for the RV and LV for all three growth abnormalities. Let's now examine fetuses with growth restriction with absent or reverse umbilical artery Doppler flow. The title of this study was Cardiac Measurements of Size and Shape in Fetuses with Absent or Reverse End Diastolic Velocity of the Umbilical Artery and Perinatal Survival and Severe Growth Restriction Before 34 Weeks of Gestation. This was published in the August issue of the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine in 2021. This study evaluated 53 fetuses with growth restriction and an absent or reversed end diastolic flow of the umbilical artery Doppler waveform. 16 had perinatal deaths and 37 were alive through the perinatal period. Fetal cardiac size and function were analyzed in each group to identify factors associated with perinatal death. Fetuses that were born alive had right and left ventricular areas less than the fifth centile. However, none of the fetuses who experienced a perinatal death had these findings. Fetuses who experienced a perinatal death had a higher rate of a dilated left ventricle. Those who were born alive did not have these findings. This represents the mean fractional shortening percentile for all 24 segments of the left ventricle. Those with perinatal deaths, represented by the red line, had values less than the 10th percentile for segments 1 to 8, located at the base of the ventricle. Segments 9 to 24, representing the mid and apical section of the, vent of the ventricle, had values less than the fifth centile. From this graph, one can see the striking difference in fractional shortening in the base of the ventricle as represented by the blue shaded area between the two groups. When evaluating the z-score for the left ventricular ejection fraction, it was significantly depressed with a z-score of minus 5.6 compared to those who were alive during the perinatal period. 94% of fetuses who died in the perinatal period had either a decreased LV ejection fraction or abnormal LV 24 segment fractional shortening. From this study, we can conclude the following. A smaller right ventricle is only present in those fetuses who did not have a perinatal death. A larger left ventricular area is present in those who had a perinatal death. Abnormal left ventricular contractility was present in those fetuses with a perinatal death as represented by the following. Decreased LV ejection fraction and decreased LV 24 segment fractional shortening. The following is a calculator I created to be used with the XML file output from the TomTech program. The calculator is free for those who are interested. This can be requested by sending me an email at grdevore at gmail.com.